Is there anything that's exciting you down the road that could work, that could start to solve this, that we could get excited about? Oh God, the last, the list is so long. I mean, I honestly think some of the most exciting stuff is stuff that I can see each of us adopting in our lives, as opposed to these kind of far out of reach. No offense, I don't have a lot of say over that steel production facility in my own daily life. So like utilities letting me check a box and say that I want 100% of my electricity to come from zero carbon resources. Like I check a box, I forget about it the next month and I have done something meaningful that is measurable. Like it sounds so boring, but that to me that's exciting. And you know what? Not not even everywhere in this country, but certainly not around the world. That's not just a default option you can pick. What I'll say is in this whole transition, I know Julio, you've got lots of great thoughts about tech. We have an opportunity to either exacerbate equity gaps, make them worse, or narrow them. And really intentional steps forward can narrow them. We know where a power plant is. The lucky thing about it is they don't have feet and they don't run around. You know, we know where it's going to be. We know the community that will be impacted. We know the makeup of that community. Like we can do things very intentionally. We won't do that if we don't think about it. Um, but Julio, you you have the rundown on the cool tech. So I'm going to pitch it over to you. There's two things that I'm super excited about. Uh, and I'm going to start with, with the most obvious and nearest term one, which is hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is going to be a big honking thing. And the nice thing about hydrogen is there's no pollution with it. None. When you consume hydrogen, it turns into water and that's it. It either makes heat or it makes electricity and either way the byproduct's water, okay? So if you make the hydrogen with a low carbon footprint, you can do a lot. And, and it's the Swiss army knife of decarbonization. It goes into heavy industry. It goes into the transportation sector. You can make fuels out of it like methanol or ammonia. You can put it straight into the grid. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. And in the, in the context of that, I want to head back to something Melissa just mentioned. Um, if you replace an existing power plant of some kind with a hydrogen plant, you should have no pollution with it of any kind. So you should be able to do that in a way that's fair and equitable. And to do that requires union labor. So you should be able to do it in a way which is good paying jobs that are long-term jobs, right? So, so there's a way in which hydrogen can be brought forward that's smart and equitable and real. And we'll see if we do that or not. Dr. Freeman, why isn't that happening now? Is because the technology is too new or just existing, just the resistance so to change in general? There, there's a couple of reasons, but uh, first and foremost, there is, there, there's no market aligned policy. It goes back to where I started, right? So we have a production tax credit for solar and wind. We have an investment tax credit for solar and wind. We got nothing for hydrogen. So who's going to make it? To make zero carbon hydrogen today costs between two times and 10 times more than hydrogen that emits. Who's going to make it? <laughs> we, need, we need to create market aligning incentives to do it. And that could be a clean energy standard, a clean electricity standard. That could be a production tax credit for low carbon hydrogen. There's all kinds of things you could do, but, but you got to start getting the market apparatus going, okay? You also need to do things like replace truck engines with fuel cells. It'll take some time. It'll take some money to do that. And you need to have fueling stations where people can get hydrogen. So there, there's, I, I could spend the whole rest of this program talking about that. I won't. There's good reasons why not, but, but that's something I'm excited about because the technology's gotten cheap enough and the ambition's gotten high enough that we're starting to get alignment between the ambition and the price. And that's, that's when exciting stuff starts to happen. And at this point, I just hope that the crazy people on both ends of the dumbbell don't shriek it away um, because in fact, there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done in the middle and it looks like we're getting to that point. The, the other thing I'm excited about is CO2 removal. So we have that residual emission stack that we can't get rid of, okay? And for the past 20 years, I've been he hearing people say, don't even talk about that because if we talk about it, we'll, we'll stop reducing emissions. Well, guess what? Like we didn't reduce emissions. We're stuffed. We still need to do this. But and people didn't want to talk about carbon capture because it would give people an excuse to keep emitting carbon. Carbon, yes. excuse me. That's like saying the existence of Diet Coke means nobody will lose weight. It's a ridiculous yeah. argument, but you know, there you there go. But but uh, <laughs> be that as it may, uh, we it's, now we ha we realize that we are going to overshoot. If we want to have a just and verdant world, we're going to have to do a lot of CO2 removal to get to zero. Again, to Melissa's point, net zero is clarifying. Zero means nothing. So if you emit anything anywhere, you have to remove that amount. 
And when you get into big scale CO2 removal, we need trees, we need soils, we need direct air capture devices, which I am excited about. We need biohydrogen with CCS. We need carbon mineralization. We need mangroves. We need all of the above on that too. There's just not enough tonnage with any one of those things. You can't get the 10 billion tons a year we're gonna need with just one thing. So it's all of the above all over again. And it gives us, I think, an opportunity to be generous with each other again to say, we know we need to spend money. We know we need to try lots of stuff. We know one of us alone is not gonna do the job. So let's all work together and do this incredibly important thing. And we're, we've seen Mark Carney at the Bank of England now launch this transparency thing for carbon offsets. We've seen a bunch of banks start getting into this. We've seen tech companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple start getting into the CO2 removal business. That's exciting. So this is a very non-scientist question uh, or maybe a possibly naive question. So there's technology out there where let's call it a device or something sucks carbon out of the air. Like how does that work? Where can it go? Like I'm just more curious of the implementation of that technology. Right, so and that's probably a That technology question. was invented in the 30s for submarines. Like we've had it for a long time. What's exciting now is we're starting to scale it. So there's a handful of companies, companies like Climeworks and Carbon Engineering that will do that, which will build the plant and suck the CO2 out of the air and store it in the deep geosphere forever. Good. So we didn't have companies 10 years ago. Now we got companies. That's a step forward. And right now the technology is ballpark four to 600 bucks a ton, which is too much to pay. Great. We know how to reduce costs. That's one thing we do know how to do. You put money into innovation, you make market aligning policies, you deploy a bunch of stuff and the costs go down. Like we've done that with everything for LEDs, for batteries, for flat screen TVs. Like we know the recipe for that one. And now we're starting to see voluntary markets come together and companies like Microsoft put money into it and companies like Carbon Direct organizing their thinking and companies like McKinsey recommending to governments that they change the way they think. Like that's like you're starting to see bits of the ecosystem come together in a useful way. And you can put that anywhere in the world. You can put it in the North Slope of Alaska. You can put it in the Gulf of Mexico. You can put it in Abu Dhabi. You need zero carbon heat. You need zero carbon electricity. As long as you got those things, you can do direct air capture. In the New York context, believe it or not, the building codes can help. Because there's a new civic code that says all buildings have to be net zero by 2025. Mm-hmm. Which is very, very and, challenging. And if they situation. don't, they thing. have to pay $477 a ton. That's enough money to start paying for stuff. And that is where, look, governments can't create value, but they can they can align incentives. They can incentivize value, right? And that's kind of where we need to go. David, what is exciting you? I want to talk about culture, right? I, I think what excites me is, I think what Julio mentioned of like, People start to are starting to see the art of the possible in clean energy, and that really excites me. And I think um, what Julio mentioned of like, you know, ten years ago, solar was ten times more expensive. You know, wind was three times more expensive, right? And when you when you like see that on a scientist projection, well, you're like, well, okay, maybe we'll see, right? When that's backward looking, that's a big deal, right? And I think people start to get excited about what the world can look like, not what it looks like today. I think you know we've been We've been spoiled by Moore's law in the technology world that, you know, things just get smaller and cheaper over time when it comes to semiconductors. What people have shown is that like the same process of like you double the scale, you reduce cost, like that doesn't just apply to semiconductors, right? And I think what part of the, we just have to start. And I think there's so many people now getting in this game and getting excited about it, that it, you know, big companies are listening, governments are listening, things are starting to change. Is it happening fast enough? No, but I think part of that is our opportunity, right? For those that are in the space to be in it and to hopefully do really well from it. I would say too, you know, I think uh, your point around short change being a four letter word, I think when it's imposed, no matter who it is, it's a four letter word, right? When you feel like you have a control of your own world and control of your own change and can benefit from that change, it's the most exciting thing in the world. And I would point to what California has done with low carbon fuel standard, you know, and like the growth in renewable energy credits that have happened as a result of for farmers that have pig farms and cow farms. Like you go up and down Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, 
there's not a cow farm and a pig farm that hasn't been knocked on their door like 20 times because it is a gold rush right now. And those guys are making a ton of money on basically taking the farts from their cows, their, their cows and their pigs and doing something with it and then selling that gas into the California market that the, that the big companies over there have to pay for. Like they are making a ton of money. You got a lot of farmers in the Midwest who've made a ton of money from wind and solar. Like that change is exciting. Right. That's why you get, I think, really positive change in those communities when it's imposed. It's negative. Right. And this, I think, clean energy is a way for entrepreneurs to benefit. One thing you recommend the average human to start doing that if everybody was doing, we'd be in a better place. I, I think what Julio said resonated with me, like learn first, care second. Um, learn what in your community, in your business, in your you know day to day life you can how you can impact. And some of it, you know, for some people is just going to be electing the right people, calling your senator, your you know, we live in a representative democracy. We have the ability to change what happens in policy. But for a lot of people, like their business can make change, right? And and I think what we talked about with efficiency, like putting LEDs is a cost benefit thing. Like it, there's a huge amount of benefits, not just mention energy efficiency. Like it, it generates more light, makes life, it makes world, the, it's safer, right? It make, makes it look better for your customers. So like simple stuff, right? Done in aggregate, I think can change the world. And I think that, as people start to learn and then care, um, I really like that as a framework. Dr. Lott, what would you say? I mean, I think it stems off of what David just said, which is realizing like, this is your health we're talking about. And this is your health right now we're talking about. This is important. This matters right now. This isn't some mystical thing in the future. And so, you know, we've got so many layers of government that we can say, hey, you represent me. This is important to me and we need to act on this. And with our collective voices, we can do a lot. Like that's how policy gets done is when we say, okay, across aisles, across conversations, like we want this, this is important to us, let's do it. So people get so consumed with DC and DC is important, but so is your local city hall. Right. Probably more important. I agree with you. Um, and Dr. Freeman, close with you. The short snippy answer, if there's one thing people can do, they can vote. Please go goddamn vote. Vote, God damn it. <laughs> We need, we need voters who vote speech. about this stuff. Not voting. We got issues, but I'm with you. Like we're still at 40% voting. Like perhaps we can do a little better than that, mm -hmm. you know. But but really the, the most important thing for people to do right now, more than anything else, even, like I'm, I still like learn and care. Like that's a good thing to do. Learn that 77% of Americans don't have rooftops, so they can't do rooftop solar. Like that's a good thing to learn before you care about how to fix that. Um, but, but the thing that I want people to do more than anything else like be generous and the person i'm channeling these days more than anybody else is yoda uh, i'm really trying to channel yoda in everything i do these days and my favorite yoda quote is fear leads to anger anger leads to hate and hate leads to suffering that's no way to fix this problem folks we can't fix it by being more angry and more shrill we got to be generous and work together to fix the problems. And if we listen and if we're generous, we can get there. <laughs>